Okay, so <clears throat> part two, we're going to start talking about applications. And we're going to look at consensus, which is a classical distributed computing problem, and the what we call tra robust transaction ledger, which this say is also, uh, you know, it's called ledger consensus or Nakamoto consensus. All right, so let's start with uh, the consensus problem. And the reason we did this is we see this agreement, you know, consistency type thing, which already started thinking about consensus. But um, the consensus problem is more specific. And actually, we started looking into this because of uh, a Nakamura observation that we'll mention. But uh, this consensus problem is one of the important problems, fundamental problems in distributed computing and plays a role in cryptographic protocols. So there are two versions. One is the consensus variant, and one is the broadcast variant, where there's one single sender. And we call that broadcast. And you know, most cryptographic protocols would assume that there's a broadcast channel, okay, and which is implemented on a you know point to point connection infrastructure right so parties just connect to each other and they want to realize this broadcast functionality we call that broadcast channel All right so this stuff has been been around for a while but with the you know advent of blockchain protocols you know this uh, renewed interest new ways of uh, achieving this as we will see you know, looking at uh, by a wider research community and so forth. So it's a brief uh, recap. How many of you are familiar with this uh, problem? All right, so we, are, so we are done. So briefly, what what is consensus? You have a bunch of parties. Some of them might be corrupted. Initial value. They are controlled by an adversary. Is the setting we were talking about. Now, there's a consensus protocol whose output would be you know, the same value to all other parties, the same value. Okay, and the condition, oh, without loss of generality for this, in this case, you can assume that uh, these values are binary because you can reduce the multi value version of the problem to uh, the binary version without much overhead. And these are the uh, basic properties. So this was uh, formulated by Lamport et al. You know, early 80s. Every party starts with initial value. The agreement condition or consistency condition means everybody output the same value. Validity means if they all started with the same value, that has to be the the value agreed on. So also called a non-triviality uh, condition. And termination means parties would eventually terminate. And as I mentioned, the single, so this everybody has initial value. There's a single source, single sender version that was originally called Byzantine Generals. So that's we make the distinction between general and Byzantine agreement. Generals meaning the single source version and agreement, the consensus version, but they are used then. In any case, the single sender version is the, what we call broadcast. And then the validity condition here is replaced by if the sender is honest, <coughs> then all honest parties have to outcome the sender's value. Okay, and the agreement is the same. And so here's the broadcast version. All right. And this is a fundamental problem, as I mentioned, and so forth. Now, so I'm going to go into some of the complexity measures because we're going to contrast these measures in the classical pre-blockchain Bitcoin world with the new, with the new bounds that uh, we can achieve. Turns out that you can you have to run the basic protocol you have to run for a number of rounds linear in the number of corrupted parties, and resiliency meaning the number of corruption that you can tolerate is one third if in the conditional setting meaning no crypto. Remember, we talked about one third, one half before. So, conditional setting uh, one third. And uh, this is a sketch of this impossibility result, also presented in a similar paper, in the original paper, that shows that this 
not concerned. So here's the single sender, the broadcast version of the problem. But you cannot achieve it with uh, less equal you know, a third. And the scenario is you now you have a sender and two receivers. Okay, and this uh, is supposed to be generals in the original story. So <clears throat> in this uh, first scenario, the sender is honest. The blue face is uh, corrupt. Sender is honest, sends the same message to everybody, but this guy is corrupt. <clears throat> so they are just communicating by sending messages to each other, right? So they don't use crypto, so there are no signatures. So these guys are going to compare notes, and this guy, the honest guy, is going to say, well, the boss said, uh, you know, we have to attack, and this guy is corrupt. He says, well, you have to retreat. Okay, so that's one scenario. And this is a scenario that is indistinguishable, say, from this guy's point of view. Okay, where now the sender is corrupt <clears throat> and says attack and retreat, right? And this guys, uh, these guys are honest, so they do the same thing. And notice that these two scenarios are distinguishable from this guy's point of view. <clears throat> so from this guy's point of view, so as to not violate validity, he has to attack, right? And symmetrically, from this point of view, this guy has to retreat. Okay, so there's a disagreement, and that's because um, n is less equal 3t. All right, and the point is that here they're not using crypto, <clears throat> because if they were, <clears throat> things would be different, right? In this case over here, the sender would have to sign the message Right? And then these guys would relay that message so they would figure out that the sender was, you know, signed two different messages. Okay, so they figure out that the sender is corrupted. Okay, but here there is, there is no crypto. And we're gonna see a similar situation when we use crypto, but when we don't have a trusted setup. Okay, because the situation that I mentioned with uh, signatures Assume that there is a PKI, a public key infrastructure, that is consistent, so everybody has the same view. Okay, so they're going to be able to verify with this signature with respect to the same um, keys. If you have a trusted setup, you know, crypto won't help, and that's what uh, we're going to look at. All right, so that was uh, an unconditional setting. In the cryptographic setting, things are different. And in fact, it turns out that consensus, so here both, pro both problems, the broadcast version and the consensus version require the same bound. But in the cryptographic setting, meaning we're using crypto and we have a PKI, broadcast you can achieve by a arbitrary number of uh, corruptions, while consensus you can't. You need the majority of honest guys. And I start relating this majority thing with what we're looking at, looking about Bitcoin, majority, honest hashing power, and so forth. Okay, so never mind complexity. Right, so, and this is the <clears throat> type of situation when you use crypto, and this has been called in this uh, literature authenticated meaning you're able to, so implicitly means that there is a trusted uh, setup, there is a public key infrastructure, all right? And you can get this, and this was done early on by Dole was strong, and this is a common protocol that is assumed mm -hmm. when you want to assume, uh, achieve a broadcast channel in cryptographic protocols. And uh, I'm gonna skip this, but it's a sketch of how this uh, protocol works. You know, the sender signs and sends to everybody, right? And then parties keep repeating this. And if they send, if they receive two different messages signed by the same guy, they relay that, right? So if at least one other party relays that, everybody is going to have this conflicting view, uh, this view of the, the sender signing two different messages. Okay, so that's the relay thing and so forth. But it's a very simple protocol that was um, designed early on. And finally, this is the term, we're using crypto, but it's a deterministic protocol. <clears throat> An important uh, development in this uh, uh, area was 
when you know the introduction of randomized protocols in which instead of having this linear number of rounds, you can achieve consensus in expected constant number of rounds. All right, and that was goes back to Braben in 83 that show how consensus in some sense reduces to having a common coin. Okay, something at each round, you know, publishes a random bit. All right, so it's, this is the probabilistic version. Now, why do we need a majority in the case of consensus? All right, it turns out that this happens regardless of the resource available to the parties. And this is something uh, sketched by Fitzy. So assume the following scenario. So now you have a, say, um, in parties, all right, and the other side can corrupt half of them, all right? And so the parties are divided with respect to, equally divided with respect to initial values. So you can have two sets, P0, P1, right? So the first half is gonna have P0, the first one is gonna have P1. And then the other strategy is as follows. So it was a constant probability, no, doesn't corrupt anybody. And with, uh, a third probability corrupts the P0, a third probability corrupts C1, P1. And after that, they follow, the, you know, obviously follow, everybody follows the protocol, All right? So what happens is, uh, you have to convert, the agreement says you have to convert to the same output, All right? And then the cases two and three would require the adversary, the parties to, you know, converge to say one value or the other, all right? But again, the situations are indistinguishable, okay? So it's not achievable. And it's a very simple, you know, sketch. And this holds for consensus, and we're gonna see later on is that this, we can adapt this situation to the case of a distributed ledger. Okay, where we have this uh, thing of transactions uh, being installed and the thing has to make progress and so forth. A variant of this um, impossibility proof tells us that to achieve this consensus, this uh, ledger consensus, you still need the majority of honest parties. Okay, but uh, just remember this, um, actually this slide, that you need the majority of honest parties for this type of problem. Okay, so what happens <clears throat> when we drop the trust setup, when we don't have a setup, then you cannot do better than a third. Okay, so you could with a half before, but now you cannot, you can only tolerate a third, and that's the same situation as in the unconditional uh, scenario where there's no crypto. Okay, and this was pointed out by Borchardt in, in 96. And we're not gonna go through the picture, but it's pretty much, <clears throat> you will recognize the picture from what we saw before, except that here is, there are signatures, which is this what uh, this is supposed to you know, say. A signs something for C, right? And he's sending in this case, the guy is honest, so he's sending the same value signed <coughs> to both parties. But here, you're gonna see that it sends two things signed differently to B and C, okay? And we are in the same situation as before. You're gonna get two signatures, but uh, they don't know which, you know, both are, there's no PKI, so they cannot um, figure out which one is uh, good. Okay, so a brief a recap of what we know about consensus and broadcast. <clears throat> this is a classical. So let's look at what's, uh, what 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 uh, new stuff happened with the blockchain. <clears throat> and remember what uh, Nakamoto said early on that <clears throat> you can use a chain, the proof of work chain, to uh, to solve this problem. Here he meant um, consensus. <clears throat> And 
he had this uh, <clears throat> story about uh, trying to hack a Wi-Fi network, and all parties have to start, you know, hacking at the same time so that uh, they would be successful. All right, but it turns out that uh, he gives up on the validity condition. Okay, you can read this uh, later, but I'll tell you how the protocol that he suggested would work. <clears throat> Now you have you want to have consensus and you want to use it you know you want to use the blockchain the way we saw it with the proof of work and so forth to you're going to run it for a while and then output some value right that is in the blockchain. So his suggestion was <clears throat> they going to start uh, adding trying to pr produce a blockchain, but now the transaction is the input value right of the party. Okay, so each miner would be one of the parties that we saw in consensus, and everybody has an input value. So they're gonna to try to build a blockchain inserting its input value. Okay, that would be the transaction. Okay, and they're gonna, they're gonna to try to insert it, but they might not you know, be successful, but they're gonna keep uh, trying, all right? So the question is, they all try to do this, and then at some point, you know, you have a version of a blockchain and now you get a longer blockchain. So what Nakamoto suggested was if a party receives a longer blockchain, you know, switches to that blockchain, which we had to, we would do before. But now it's also switches its input. Okay, so the party gives out its input, got a, a blockchain that contains, say, a one, in the data field, and he had a zero. So I said, well, now I'm switching to one. I'm gonna to try to create a blockchain with one. Again, so here, if you follow this blockchain literature, is that it's not just the input transaction value, right? You're gonna have a nonce, right? Otherwise, um, you know, so they will make this uh, proof of work sort of independent. Okay, so both parties are trying to insert a zero or a one. So besides that, they have some, you know, random, they have some randomness to the, to the input. But the transaction value is the input value, one or zero. All right, so, and he says when the blockchain is long enough, the, the party outputs unique value that it contains. Okay, but they, it's easy to see that this doesn't work because the adversary has a constant probability of, you know, being successful first. Okay, so you can already, they're gonna be successful, they're gonna, gonna sp spread this value, everybody's gonna switch to that value, right? And then we gave up on validity. Is that clear? So, this won't work. Because if that happened, then the parties are gonna extend the chain using the adversary's input. So they're, they're, they're giving up on their own input. Okay, so in that sense, this suggestion doesn't solve consensus. And we're gonna see a way. So this this is how we did it in the, how we derived these properties. Now we have these properties, agreement, validity, and we wanna derive them from common prefix, chain quality, and so forth. Okay, so this is what this uh, means. And this means that it achieves agreement with the half probability, but doesn't achieve validity. Right? It only achieves validity with a negligible proportion of uh, corrupt guys. Okay? And in turn, in, uh, instead, we're going to show an easy twist of this protocol, the Nakamoto protocol, that achieves something better, still suboptimal, right? because you saw one half before, and this only achieves one third. Okay, and this is the first uh, twist where, okay, we start us in the Nakamoto suggestion, but uh, so you get a longer chain, you adopt that chain, but you don't give up on your input value. You still try to insert your input value. Okay, so probabilistically, you know, input guy, uh, honest guys are gonna be able to insert their values. We're gonna have this uh, situation a common prefix situation, and we're gonna apply the same function to that, right? Say majority. 
And it turns out that if the fractional corruption is one third, you do this, you apply turn off bounds, and you know, everybody uh, agreement holds. And if all the oldest parties start with the same value, validity holds. Okay, but for that you need, uh, you can only tolerate one third. All right, and uh, naturally the agreement follows from the common prefix and validity from the chain quality, right? Because validity, the chain quality tells us what's the proportion of, of um, inputs that the good guys got inside the blockchain. Now, I remember, I'm going to show you this. You're not going to go over the details, but I show you these uh, functions that you can use to specify uh, applications. And they kind of look like this. Okay, you're able to specify the validation predicate, you know, how to read and how to, how to read and how to uh, write stuff out. And basically, it's very, very, what, do, what do they have to verify in the, the validation predicate? Here, you just want to know that the value is a one or a zero. Right, those, are, those are valid values. We don't have fund transfers or sufficient funds and stuff. All you care is that the input has to be a valid input, one or zero, and that you have some nonce. This is the row thing. You have some random value in the mix. Okay, but formally you can specify this application, consensus application, using this function. Right? And we we'll skip this, but we can show uh, agreement and probably uh, validity, which I skip. Right, it is clear. So this is how uh, consensus we could use the blockchain to achieve this classical consensus problem. One issue, though, is that is, uh, we saw that one half corruptions, less than one half corruption, would be optimal, and here we achieve one third only. Okay, and remember, we say that the chain quality property was very weak, right? The guarantees, because the adversary has more power, is able, able to insert more stuff. Okay, so that's the intuitive reason why we get uh, less than optimal. <clears throat> and then we show another protocol that achieves, uh, that achieves one half, the optimal bound, with a cute trick called two for one proofs of work. Essentially, you want to combine two proofs of work okay, in one. And what are those two, two proofs of work? So we're going to limit the adversary, not just in generating blocks, but also in, at the application level. Okay? If they want to insert a input value, he has to solve a second proof of work. And that, that calms things down, right? So it makes the, power, the adversary less powerful. Right, so with two proofs of work, we can do this. But now the question is, we have two proofs of work and we have a fixed bound on the number of queries, the number of proofs of work that we can try each round, then the adversary can do, there's no guarantee that the adversary might you know, deviate my transfer computational power from one to the other, right? So, this is what I'm saying here. And this is uh, how it works. It has a transaction production protocol as well. You would recognize the, how this is uh, written because it's the same thing as you know, trying to generate a block. But now it's a transaction, at the transaction level. right? So here is the input value, some nonce and so forth, and less than the target difficulty. Okay, and the protocol will go the same way as before. You would run it for, say, 2k, 2 kappa rounds, prune the last k, and then look at the first k, and then uh, output majority. Okay, and this is uh, cute. I'm going to skip. But this is how to combine two percent of work into one. And here is, uh, well, so you, you have to do this for one in one case, and this is another proof of work. All right, and this would be like two percent of work separately. And this is, as I mentioned, not secure because the guy can, uh, you know, move computational power around. So here's another way of doing it. Okay, so you can think of the 
target difficulty, you know, leading zeros, right? And you can flip it and say the beginning zeros, right? And you want to get something in the middle. So now this way, intuitively, if you reverse the strings, right, you want to be in that uh, region. Of course, that's going to work, uh, you know, and you need these two things to be independent, right? So if these things overlap, you lose that. But as long as they don't, right, you, you can do it. Okay, that's the basic idea. And this is a way that shows how we're going to combine uh, both. So we combine the, the transaction values in the two proofs of work that we're trying to do, you know, XS, X prime, S prime. And now, this thing that we get, see, we got the, the R stands for reverse. We reverse a string. So you want to say it has to be smaller than some value and the reverse bigger than some value. All right? And that should hold simultaneously. And this shows how you would take care of the other. You know, you pay attention. And then you look at one, you don't pay attention to the second one, and vice versa. Intuitively, right, that's how we combine two proofs of work. And what that gives us is consensus. BA stands for business agreement using requiring the optimal number of um, corruptions, tolerating the, the optimal number of corruptions. And with the same protocol for the next application, we're going to show that we get these properties of the ledger you know, with the same bound. OK, so we talk about consensus. And now let's take a step back. Is there like a common approach to both cases? And it turns out that, that you can think of <clears throat> that's a wrong, wrong reference. You can think of this uh, proof of work as a signature-like primitive, OK, where you're authenticating something. You are proving that you did some work on something. OK, and in fact, we have, in the references, I have uh, something that we call signatures of work. Right, so you can cast this approach of proving something as a signature, same as in the cryptographic setting, authenticated setting, you know, sender signs and sends stuff around. OK? And the, then the underlying idea is somewhat similar in the sense that <clears throat> the parties try to broadcast their inputs. OK? And those inputs are authenticated because they're saying this input is being, I'm validating this input because I just did work on this. Right? So like I'm, I'm signing this uh, piece of work. And you do this for a while, and then you take majority after, you know, you achieve a common view. So taking a step back, there's some similarity between these two approaches. They're not that different. But the enabling primitive is different. It's the proof of work that has some signature-like uh, properties. Questions? OK, so. So let's see what happens with the transaction ledger, also known as ledger consensus. We know what we need it for, you know, funds uh, transfers. And here's some, like, the basic properties that this uh, object should satisfy. And this is related to another traditional problem called state replication machine state machine replication in distributed systems. And this article by Schneider, early 90s. And essentially saying now the situation is your parties, you have like a distributed system, you have like a distributed database installing you know, transactions. Okay, and some of those guys might be corrupt. And what you want to achieve is <clears throat> consistency, meaning you know, this thing should um, uh, if all the servers you know, implementing this service you know, should have the same view of the, of the transactions in the system. And liveness, meaning that you know, transactions, new transactions should be inserted. 
Okay, so those are the two properties, consistency and liveness. I'm going to see an additional property later. And this is how you would, remember we're talking about specifying these applications through these uh, functions. And you can do, you know, a similar thing where now the verification predicate would take all the transactions in the ledger, okay, and determine whether this is a valid transaction. Okay, so nothing special. And here I we formulate what the syntax of this uh, thing should be. We talk about signatures for you know transferring funds. We specify what an account looks like, you know, Bitcoin like. Remember we saw this. And the transaction then would be. <clears throat> You know, if you have this uh, bunch of things, it's a signature where, you know, things get transferred. All right, so where the A primes are the accounts to be debited. I see. So see, there's a prime here, and there's no prime here except for the apostrophe. So we have a bunch of accounts that transfer to these accounts this fund. Okay, a bunch of syntax, but it's nothing, uh, nothing deep. And there should be signatures correspond, you know, corresponding to the verification keys. All right, so there's a syntax for this. And what the main validity property that it's had to hold is that there should be stuff get transferred, right? So the capital, you know, existing capital should be bigger than, what, than the stuff that gets transferred. Okay, and you can express all this uh, in a simple way, all right? So this is how we can specify the, the uh, distributed ledger. And we can show, again, that consistency, the property that we, yeah. one of the properties that we saw, follows from common prefix, and liveness follows from these two, and it's natural because, uh, you know, chain growth gives us, uh, intuitively give, give us uh, liveness. And that's how we obtain this column here. Okay, and recall that we talked about this for consensus. <clears throat> so in this paper, which is a ta consensus taxonomy uh, paper, we show how to extend this to ledgers, right? So we, where we adapt this possibility proof. And here we're just not talking about you know input and output values. We're talking about you know transactions and conditions that have to hold per, between transactions. Uh, for example, a transaction could be invalid, meaning it could not be a, could not exist at the same time. You can think about weaker properties like order of transactions, where these transactions come before this or the other way around. Right? There's some sort of um, Additional property that's neither called order in this um, in his um, paper, and we're going to call it serializability because we talk about order in that sense. Except that serializability in the distributed computing world is uh, also a touch, you know, it's another um, property that has been used. So we just limit serializability to this. Um, uh, Context and it intuitively says conflicting transactions cannot appear in the ledger. Okay, and the, the proof just says, but you know, one guy is going to have transaction in, in this order, and the other guy is going to have transaction in this order. All right, and this, the scenario is similar as we saw for consensus, where we partition things into two halves. Okay, and one half gets so one transaction. So Tx1, the other half is the other so Tx2. So they, then you apply liveness, meaning that the, these parties have to, con, the ledger of these parties have to contain this transaction. And then serializability, if you apply that, means in one case, this order cannot happen. Okay, and that contradicts uh, consistency. Sketch at the high level, but this is how you, you would argue that also for distributed, for ledgers, you need this majority uh, condition, honest majority condition. All right, so 
this is what we have so far. We saw the Bitcoin backbone. We talked about maturity of mining power. And now we're going to talk about the Genesis block. All right. And we remember we talked about the network computational model. We said that uh, we had this in an unpredictable Genesis block, which in the case of Bitcoin was some headline of uh, the Times of London, arguably unpredictable. So it was published, and this should be this was the stuff that miners had to mine on. Okay, arguably unpredictable. And this is the you know the first block that would appear in the in the blockchain. All right, it turns out that you don't need this. And this is what we show in PKC 18 with these guys. And what do we say? Where, so people will start from, you know, there's no Genesis block, right? So what happens then is that the adversary could be activated much earlier and start mining. Okay, and then the honest parties will start, will get activated um, much later. Okay, so we show in this case that if you add this uh, challenge exchange, challenge exchange phase, all right, and then you continue with mining and update the genesis, then from this point on, you can apply, you can run the backbone protocol. All right, and this idea was actually suggested earlier. by Aspness et al. in the in tech report in the pre-Bitcoin. But essentially, what is this uh, challenge exchange phase? Okay, so the, the, the corrupt part is got activated, you know, beginning of time, and they're being binding and so forth. Now the good guys get activated. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna exchange our random challenges. Okay, activated, I sent a random challenge to everybody, People hash all of the challenges and send back what they have, and they keep doing it a bunch of times. But the thing is, is intuitively is uh, easy for the parties to know to uh, uh, attest to the freshness of strings that they receive if they find their own random challenge included in one they get back, right? So if I generate a random challenge last round and I get it next, I know that it's very fresh. Okay, if I don't see my stuff, this could have been done, you know, early on. Okay, that's the intuition why this uh, works. And you can see this here, how you generate random stuff, right? And then you get a bunch of random stuff from the network, you congratulate all that, and you add some random stuff and you keep doing it. All right, and doing it this way, you are in this situation where you did this challenge exchange, you have to do some convergence here, but then from this point on, you can run the, it's like you converge on a Genesis block and then you can apply the backbone. Okay, so no Genesis block. And that means no Genesis block, we get the backbone thing, then we can have our applications right, consensus, and ledger without trusted setup, right? So now what we are achieving is consensus, uh, to, you know, with the honest majority and no trusted setup, which we saw that in the classical world was impossible. Oh, okay, so another application that we gave with this is that now you can, do, if you don't need a trusted setup, you can, uh, get a PKI from scratch. Okay, you don't need a trusted party uh, generating a PKI, all right? And this is means that you, in some sense, you can transition from a permissionless network to the uh, classical permission network without the help of a trusted party. Okay, so uh, this is somewhat curious because we're not going to go through the whole thing, but this is in a paper called a consensus taxonomy. That's in the ePrint, where we divided this into the classical world 
and the blockchain world, and the layers means where here's the network, what happens at the network layer, this in the classical world is point-to-point -point connectivity, right? And here is to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, where we have this diffusion mechanism. In this layer is we look at what kind of setup is needed. And in this layer, what are the computational assumptions? <clears throat> okay, so the classical world, if you follow this uh, blue line, okay, we are getting, remember I mentioned this Dolev strong protocol that for consensus tolerates uh, a half, less than a half of corruptions. Okay, and that works with a PKI because it's a signature, and we call that we call that a private state setup because in this setup parties get some private information, as opposed to a public state setup where I publish something for everybody, like a CRS. Okay, so we call that private setup. We use signatures, so one-way functions, and we get uh, this much. That's the blue line, and in in you know, related uh, way, this would be the, pro the backbone protocol where we can achieve consensus with an honest majority. All right? So all this for synchronous. Yeah. Yeah, so you need it to be somewhat synchronous anyway. So asynchronous, you cannot do anything on this. Yeah, but things here in this uh, partially synchronous version, you lose, instead of one half, you get like one third and so forth. And, and also here, but this is all uh, synchronous. But this is for the synchronous. Yeah. All right, so backbone give us consensus with, uh, pub with trusted setup, although it's public. But now remember we saw this worker, the impossibility result that said that if there is no setup, okay, so you could not better than one third. Okay, that's a red line. And you know, you use signatures, but no PKI, right? And this is what he showed. But if you look now what we just, uh, I just talked about, when there's no Genesis block, so you are no setup, you use these uh, things and you get a consensus with the uh, you know, majority, all right? So, why? What, where's, the, where's the catch? And recall this impossibility result that we saw. What happens in the proof of work world and this is something that we are investigate, we investigated in a recent paper, which uh, a paradigm that we call resource restricted cryptography, which in some sense subsumes Manoj resource fairness, right? Where you don't talk about arbitrary polynomial time parties, adversaries, but now it's more of an exact security thing. How many steps, computational steps? you're able to uh, perform. And in this case, this type of scenario breaks down because for this party to be able to, say, sign two messages, conflicting messages, right? If you're in the polynomial time world, you know, you just share two signatures and you just send them on the same message. But in this resource restricted uh, world, you, you're not able to. Okay, that's the basic uh, reason. All right, so I'll point to this in the references. Okay, so the stuff that I'm only gonna be mentioning briefly is the following, starting with variable difficulty. And what we saw is that now we were assuming in the previous analysis that now the policy is fixed and the difficulty is fixed. Right, but what Bitcoin does is uh, it adjusts this difficulty. It has a target recalculation mechanism, 
which captures the fact that this situation is dynamic. So parties can join and leave, right? So things might get more parties, then you might be getting more, you know, blo more blo blocks and proofs of work and so forth. Okay, so here we did uh, in this uh, crypto 17, with the, we look at this situation where we allow, so we see, okay, so we're gonna let, we have this target calculation thing, I'm gonna see what, if we can prove these properties under what conditions, and uh, so we, we put this constraint about the fluctuation of parties. Okay, so how much parties can go from one round to the next. Okay, so there's a bound, how, how many they can, how much they can change. And the idea is that, remember this F quantity that we had before, is to maintain, and that's a reason for Bitcoin for the target calculation, is you want to maintain this quantity, you know, stable, constant, approximately. All right, and so we prove there are more parameters, but um, if properties don't fluctuate widely, we can, you know, provide, prove the same type of properties. Again, and this is in the, in the synchronous, perfect synchronous uh, case, and it extends to the, the delta delay or partially synchronous model, and it's something that we are writing up. Okay, and the intuition is, remember this happened in the static, this was the static setting, we remember this picture, that you were to put this, uh, prove this property, you needed, you know, adversary successes to be competitive with respect to the good guys, right? So, in order to achieve this, the adversary has to be, you know, succeed more than the good guys, okay? And in the variable, in the variable difficulty or in the dynamic setting, you know, now we are talking about difficulty, not just these events, because difficulty changes. And for obviously to keep doing this, he would have to have a difficulty bigger than the difficulty accumulated by the honest guys. It's a similar type of reasoning with different things. And in fact, the analysis is different because um, now you have to keep, before it was like Bernoulli trials independent and so forth, right? You have to care about that. Now you have to care about the past. So you have conditional probabilities. Uh, the tool that captures that, that is uh, Martingales. Okay, so that's the main uh, ingredient here. All right, so that was briefly mentioned what happens in the in dynamic setting. The last two things is um, we keep talking about honest majority, you know, honest majority, and so forth. And this is a, a pie diagram of mining pools. Okay, most of them are in China, but it would not be unthinkable that these guys collude and they would control everything, right? So how come that's and that's why we call it. Why does it work? Okay, so what we we doing so far is uh, looking at this majority, proving things, assuming this majority, and so the questions are: How come Bitcoin is not broken? Because these guys could easily collude, and they probably know this. And if the honest guys themselves are aware of this, why do they keep mining? It seems like a hopeless uh, situation to invest and no rewards. All right, so in this thing that we call rational protocol design, which is a framework that we developed a few years back, we apply it to this analysis, analysis of Bitcoin, and we show that our under natural incentives, and that's essentially make money. Okay, so if all the adversary wants is to make money and assuming some conditions on Bitcoin's monetary value. All right, so this is gonna, you don't need this honest majority assumption. All right, so even though majority collisions may be possible, things are gonna keep working. Okay, in some sense we are replacing a cryptographic adversary 
by a much weaker adversary that is very focused, right? So we know that uh, it's not going to deviate, deviate arbitrarily. It's going to try to you know keep mining to 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 get rewards. All right. So the final note, which bring, brings me to uh, there are other, as was mentioned, you know, proof of um, space, proof of memory. Uh, proof of stake is a, this as popular, the most second popular option, but it contains another. So proof of work is the main, you know, more this, this, the disruptive primitive that allow us to do these things and brings us to this resource restricted uh, cryptography world. All right, but as I was mentioned, it's very wasteful, right, and so forth. So people looked at. You know, proofs of stake protocols. And just to remind you, this is a virtual resource, and that's going to be a randomized process that takes this resource in order to elect the next eligible miner. Right? And this is much more efficient because you know, no mining, you no know, uh, computational effort. And essentially, it's being like two. Uh, main uh, approaches for this. One is the proof of stake blockchains. Okay, and that was uh, pointed out early on by a proposal called Next and formalized by Kiaias et al. in a series of papers in the protocol called Ouroboros and Pass and Chi and others in this uh, Snow White approach. And here is, is a blockchain based, meaning you're going to be creating a blockchain data structure. Okay, you want to have to satisfy the properties that we saw before. But here there's no effort in generating a block, right? So you need some sort of selection, you know, random selection that's going to take the stake into account. And you have some other issues when that happens. Okay, so that's the, this uh, venue, this proof of stake of blockchains. And the second approach is we mentioned that traditional consensus, there's a randomized option, a randomized version. Raven showed that, you know, uh, reduces to a random coin, which is used to select a leader in those consensus protocols. So why don't you use the proof of stake to elect a leader? Okay, and then adapt the existing BFT, Business Default Tolerant Protocols algorithms to, for that purpose. And this was done by Mikali16, where he, Feldman Mikali, were the first to generate, the, to, to present a randomized consensus protocol from scratch, right? No, try to set up, you know, sending a beacon each round, but t generate a random coin from scratch. Okay, the same type of protocol. He figured out, uh, you know, uh, he would adapt that protocol to get some sort of proof of stake. Um, uh, it's not blockchain, but it's, uh, for leader election. All right. And notice that this thing is not resource restricted because generating this proof of, proof of stake is, uh, you know, very easy. Okay, they don't fall in this category, but they have some other, they have some other issues, and you can look at these things. This is sort of related to the not resource restricted and this long range uh, business that has to do with how things uh, assets get transferred as a protocol you know, proceeds and so forth. So there are some other issues that they have to t be taken care of. Anyway, but this is the, how you would use stake. And the main primitive enabling this is verifiable random functions. Okay, that's the other, from my point of view, the other interesting primitive that enables these things to happen. All right, and just to remind you what these things are, are, it has two, uh, three properties, you know, key generation, evaluation, eval, and verify. Okay, and this uh, thing, so verification key, uh, signing key, 
And this thing is uh, sort of a pseudo random value and a proof, okay, that everybody can verify. Okay, and the proof is that you know this random value was generated with this um, secret key. Okay, this was a notion proposed by Mikali, Raven, Sadan, late 90s. Okay, a very cute primitive, but intuitively it's easy to see how you could elect a leader, you know, using this uh, using this uh, tool. All right, so everybody is going to be signing stuff according to his take, um, other stuff. You can apply the same rule, say, I want this unpredictable, uh, this random value to be less than a target value. Okay, you, you, can, you have to add time there. In this round, I signed this, I generated this, and it's smaller than the, some target value, right? And therefore, I'm the winner. Okay, I can try again. You know, I'm not the winner this time. So locally, you can generate this thing, and this can be universally verified. Okay, so I say, Cute, you know, very efficient, simple uh, coin tossing uh, that uh, allows it, allows us to elect a leader. Which doing it in the classical world is, um, I call it classical, but um, it's not non-quantum, right? So the old, the older. Okay, so this is the main um, thing, you know, um, that allows this to happen. They can be easily instantiated with the you know, DDH, and the random oracle model, so very easy to instantiate. Okay, and you need some other stuff, as, such as you know, key evolving signatures and beacon. You need to re-enter fresh randomness every time and so forth, but this is like the main uh, primitive. Okay, so I wanted to mention that and contrast this to the proof of work you know, primitive, which is, you know, has this uh, impact in creating new things. Here, the verifiable random functions does not create new things in the sense that this stuff, as a person, is permissioned, right? So you need, a, you need identities, you need a signing key, right, and so forth. But the disruptive value is in being able to generate a leader much more efficiently than before. Yeah, so this is monopoly. So there are other issues that you have to take care of. Yeah, so you have to take care of other issues. And in fact, and uh, if you want to do this uh, blockchain-based approach, you know, this is the long-range attack. You know, it's very easy to generate histories, right? And if you control, the adversary controls the network, you know, it's not as before in the proof-of-work case that, uh, you know, you cannot make up stuff, right? You really have to do work and prove, you prove that you've done work and you're the winner. Here it's much easier. So you have to count probabilities of, uh, you know, things getting lucky when they, when they're elected and so forth. And so it's a, and they also, yeah, it's a different body of work. But I just wanted to uh, talk about this, of the power of VRF in this uh, context. So that's what we did. And let me tell you what the relevant references are. The, most of the stuff is, is uh, in this uh, Bit, Bitcoin Backbone paper in, from Eurocube uh, 15. The stuff about avoiding the Genesis block is in the PKC. We call it bootstrap in the blockchain. The variable difficult stuff was in Crypto 17. The rational analysis was in Eurocrypt. 18, and this, oops, this um, nice picture that I show you, the taxonomy of consensus is in this paper that is going to appear in the CTRSA coming up. I mentioned this, this signature-like flavor of proofs of work, and we also we have a paper on this called Consensus from Signatures of Work. So we cast the proof of work as a signature primitive and figure out what the properties are, properties you need to use them in a blockchain setting. Okay, that actually starts isolating what are the properties of proofs of work that you need for blockchain. Okay, in the random oracle, things are easier. Very easy, right? It gives, it gives us everything. But if you want to do this in the standard model, things get more complicated. 
And we have some, we made some progress in this paper where we cast this proof of work as an iterated search problem. Iterated because you have to, you know, keep doing work and you build on the previous uh, thing and so forth. And here we show that you, how you can show security of a blockchain under falsifiable assumptions. Finally, I mentioned this resource restricted cryptography paper. And this is something that is on the ePrint and in submission, where we show how you can, in this world, how you can do things, same as we talk about consensus, how you could, you know, you could do things in a different way and the bounds don't hold anymore. And finally, this uh, variable difficulty analysis in the partially synchronous uh, network. And with that, it's a wrap. Thanks very much. Thank you.